Good afternoon. Welcome to the press conference for Coco Goff. Please raise your hand, state your name and organisation when asking your question. Coco, how are you feeling to be back at Wimbledon? I'm feeling great to be back here. Um, I love this tournament. I love playing here. And yeah, I'm super excited to play. Questions? Yasmin? Okay, firstly, I'm glad you went without option number three. Okay, you watch my TikTok. <laughs> um, it's been five years since you had your massive breakthrough here. If you could tell that girl what you've accomplished so far, do you think you would have expected it because you had high expectations, or do you still think it would be a surprise? Um, ooh, I think a little bit of both. I think I had high expectations at that age, and I still do. Um, but obviously, like, everybody has high expectations, and, um, and especially when you're on tour at such a young age, but... Yeah, I think it'll be both a surprise and, and, satis and satisfied um, with where I am right now. Really? Coco, there have been seven different women's champions here in the last seven Wimbledons. What are your thoughts when you hear that, and how does it affect you and your outlook? Yeah, I actually was paying attention to that when I was looking at the champions wall that they have at Orangi, and I was like, oh, this is like a lot of different names, which um, I, I guess like is something that is new, not new, but like kind of new post Serena, post um, all, a lot of the legends. So I think for me, it just shows that there's a lot of talent on the women's tour and, and it's anybody's game. And um, my outlook, I mean, it gives you confidence, obviously, when you see that, you know, the field isn't stacked. I mean, I guess it's stacked in the way where it's like one player dominating or three players dominating. I think everybody has an equal shot and it's just about who can perform better that week. Uh, Coco, obviously, tennis in general in the summer, there's always big stuff and it's and it's crammed. But with an Olympic year as well, I know you couldn't go to Tokyo because of COVID. So yeah. how do you pace yourself in a year where, you know, there's just lots of big stuff happening back to back? Are you approaching it any differently or are you not paying attention to that? Yeah, I think for me, it's... I think it's trying to minimize the moments as much as possible because, you know, right after this, you know, I'm not playing any warm up tournament before Olympics. So it's basically two big tournaments for me back to back, which I, I've never, you know, and I don't think any player unless they played Olympics has done before. So um, it's it's kind of a unique thing. So I, I think this tournament, like I'm good, you know, because um, this is a normal part of our schedule. But it'll be interesting, you know, how everything feels playing such a big tournament with the Olympics and walking the open, opening ceremony and then, or riding, I guess it's on a boat, and then having to play like the next day. So um, yeah, I'm very interested, but I've been trying to put myself in the mindset of just enjoying the experiences um, because you're only gonna have your first Olympics once. So yeah, and for me with Wimbledon, I'm really relaxed going into this year. Um, you know, I did not have a great Wimbledon last year, so it's like, it, it can't get any worse. It can only get better or the same, so yeah. One person you can meet at the Olympics from a different sport, who would you want to meet? Ooh, uh, it's probably Simone Biles, um, Shakari Richardson, and uh, actually, I was going to say two people, but I already met them. So, yeah, but I'm looking forward to seeing Gabby Thomas and Sydney McLaughlin again. <laughs> Ma uh, hey, Coco. Um, how. In Australia, it was your first Grand Slam being a Grand Slam champion. This is your first Grand Slam being the number two player in the world. Um, how does that affect you? I mean, maybe not at all because you still have to win seven matches. But does it, has it, does it come into your head at all differently being there in terms of where you are in the draw versus where other players are? Um, not really. I mean, the, the ranking is just a number. I think maybe if I was number one, I might feel different. But two, three, four, <laughs> five, it's uh, anything like for me, it's all interchangeable. Um, if you're, you know, you're not number one. So uh, yeah, I don't, I haven't taken too much attention to it. Does it matter for you that he gets on the other side of the draw? Uh, no, I'm, I mean, there's tournaments where she's on the same side or on the other side. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. If you, you wanna win, you gotta be everybody regardless of where they are in the draw. Yep. Hi, Coco. Hi. Hi. Um, there's so many aspects of being a, a tennis pro, um, I don't know, competing, dealing with victories and defeats, growth, of the mental side, traveling. What, what's the one thing that you love the most about the 
sport and being a pro in? What's the one thing that you that sucks? Yeah, uh, I think the one thing I love, there's a lot of things, but probably just a connection with people. Um, you know, the other last week I met a boy who was a fan of me and he like was starting to get emotional and teary eyed when he met me. So it's just things and interactions like that that make you realize that what you're doing on the court does matter, whether you're having the best time of your life and winning everything or whether you're having a, a short stunt or a short bad moment and losing. Um, it just makes interaction with humans just so satisfying and, and makes you feel uh, worth it. And then one thing I don't like, um, maybe just the bad, angry betters online. Um, they're a little bit annoying, um, but like, I love the block button, so um, I know it was like a thing on Twitter about how much I block people, but it's like, bye. <laughs> David. Hi there, Coco. Uh, you mentioned the match that you lost in the first round last year. I just wondered if you could compare how you feel about where you are with your game right now, given the year you've had since then, compared to where you would have been when you were sitting there a year ago. Yeah, oh my, I wish you're going me after that match can see me now. Yeah, that was a, a tough moment for me. I, 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 you know, the I think the first two or three weeks after that, I was like really in a dark place, and it was tough for me to realize that I had so much time. I guess when that happens, you just feel the weight of everything on you. Um, but I think I've just grown a lot, and I, I'm glad I used that moment to just strive to get better and I still know I'm nowhere near where I can be. Um, so yeah, I think that experience taught me that a bad moment doesn't last forever. That part of the season was tough and then the next part of the season was the best I've ever had. So that just shows, you know, bad moments don't last for, forever. When you had your first break breakthrough here five years ago, I remember standing with your parents and they had fans screaming their names <laughs> around the grounds. And, and I'm wondering five years on, maybe it's more a question for them, but from your eyes, I guess it's different for you when you're adjusting when you're in the thing, but the entourage as well, they're with you on tour. How do you feel they've adjusted to this life with you on the tour? Yeah, I think both my parents had to get used to saying no because like, you know, a lot of people will come up to them if they want something for me. And then the first they'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll get this for you. I'll have her sign this. And then it just became becomes more and more. And then they're like, OK, uh, I'm not going to bother her. So my dad's favorite like saying is like, they'll ask, can you go get Coco? And then he's like, Coco's grown. I don't I don't know where she is. <laughs> like um, I'm her dad, but like she just she goes off, which I do um, and just do whatever. Uh, so I think they had to you get used to saying no and not feeling, you know, uh, sad about saying no to somebody because, it, you know, people can get a little bit um, a lot and they don't realize the weight of some things that they're asking and, and they think they're the only one that asks too. So I think they had to get used to, to saying no. Um, so my parents had got better at that, but before they used to be like, yeah, yeah. And then before you know, it's like a hundred things in a week that they've agreed to me signing or something. Uh, you mentioned the seven different winners of Wimbledon in the last seven years, uh, which shows that this year, I guess, with a few contenders who could win it. Do you think that signals this is a particularly strong period for women's tennis? And which women on the tour do you admire or, or look up to? The most? Yeah, I definitely think that it shows that, you know, the tour in general is just so strong. And I feel like there's so much depth in the in the game. Um, you know, top 50, top 10, top five, whatever. I think it, everybody has like an equal chance of, of winning. Um, and players that I admire on tour, um, obviously Iga is somebody who has a, a great mentality and she wins a lot. Um, um, Anne Schreber, I think she's the nicest person and such a competitor on and off the court. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Anne's is somebody that was one of the first players to be super nice to me when I was 15 coming on tour. And I was scared, but you know, of just, meeting like people that you saw on TV and she was one of the players that was really nice. So I, I think uh, especially her. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.